welcome Olive Branch. Uh, thanks for joining us for our online service. I'm Brad. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and today, as we enter into worship together, we are going to be singing a song that I think is just so appropriate for just the times we're living in, the state of the world today, all that's been going on in the news. And, um, it's a song called, Is He Worthy? And it's a song that just reminds us uh, you know, in the middle of all that's going on, um, just to look to Jesus, to keep our eyes on Jesus. And, and despite all that's going on, it asks the question, you know, is he still worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? And, and the obvious, clear answer and the reminder to our hearts is that he is. And um, this song is normally a call and response song. And great with a congregation, but I didn't want you guys online to miss out on, on a song with so much truth and so much power in it. And so each phrase of the song asks a question, and, and in a congregational setting, I would sing, you know, does the Father truly love us? And then they would answer, he does, right? Does the Spirit move among us? He does. Or whatever the question is, we sing it together, and it um, but for those of you at home or in your car or wherever you're watching this, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to just sing out a new song, but um, I would encourage you just to, to sing out the answers uh, and, and just speak that truth to your own heart and from your own heart to God as we worship. So here it is. This is called Is He Worthy? Is anyone able to break the seal 
and open the scroll. The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slain. Every people and tribe. Most of us remember that day. It's etched in our minds, a permanent reminder of tragedy. We all watched helplessly as lives were lost, heroes were born, and a nation was forever changed. The loss was unimaginable, the sorrow unbearable, but through that pain, we witnessed the resolve of a nation. We saw chaos give birth to courage. Fear transform into fortitude. And destruction give way to determination. In the midst of the brokenness, freedom stood immovable. Today, we remember those we lost. We honor the heroes who saved so many and grieve with the families who have suffered so much. It's been 20 years, but we still remember and we will never forget. Wow, it's been 20 years already since 9-11. And you know, it can be really easy in 20 years to kind of get caught up in the day-to-day -day life. We get busy, uh, moment, living moment to moment. The stresses of our current lives kind of weed out times where we can actually take a time to even remember what happened in our past, to reflect on the things that we saw 20 years ago. Some of us might not have even been born that time or barely born or just a child and don't really know what it was like prior to 9-11. I know for myself, uh, there were people that I knew that were greatly affected by this incident. I served at a church one time and, and there was an, a guy by the name of Al Mershon, a great guy, used to shake hands with people. I think he was one of the ushers. And he would happen to be one of those guys who was on the second airplane as an airline steward as it crashed into the towers. And I remember the church coming together and people filling the church and praying for his family and praying for our nation. 
I remember uh, when the Pentagon was attacked, uh, I had a commanding officer that we used to have that served in the Pentagon at the time, and we didn't know what happened to him. We didn't know if he had been killed or if he was okay. Turned out he was fine, but it was just those images of what it was like on those days when people were coming together and rescuing people in buildings um, and people rescuing those people on the plane uh, that landed in Shakespeare, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can forget as a nation, but one of the things I want us to remember is that how we felt when we came together and how easy it is for us to get caught up in, in forgetting that we need to pray for the unity. And so as a church, uh, you can see where God knows those people and we are like no other people. Uh, we, we have a tendency to forget. This is why we have things like for the Jews in Israel, they had Passover where God re wanted to remind people of the things that he had done for them. And the, and the things that he had brought when he brought his nation together. When he brought his disciples before a great tragedy was about to be crucified, he gave them communion to remember. And I think it's, it's good to remember the things that we've transpired in the past as a people and as a nation. And it's good to remember those things that when we have our tragedies, how we deal with them. And when we deal with them by coming together in unity to continue in that spirit, whether it's 20 years or 100 years or however many years, that we don't forget what it's like and what the things that the nation has gone through to come together and to fight together uh, to protect one another, to love one another, and, and to be a, a people. So what I wanted to do today is just pray for that, pray for our nations. I want to take a moment of silence to just remember those who may still be grieving of a lost loved one or who are struggling with the pain of that day, who may still have PTSD or the things that they saw. I want to pray for our nation. I want to take some time just to reflect on Am I really being in that same spirit of unity that we saw, we saw on that day as a nation? And am I someone that wants to bring about unity in our nation? Um, and, and to take that sacrificial rescue of going above and beyond and putting down my own needs and caring for the needs of others. And so I want to take that time to just take a moment to pray for those who, who continue, who fought in our wars since 9-11 who still have trouble wrestling with what to do and praying for those that protect our freedoms, the people on a day-to-day, -day, our first responders, our cops, our police officers, our soldiers, that day-to-day protect us uh, because they believe in, in a sense of unity. So I want to continue to pray for that as a nation. So I just want to take a moment and then I'll close. And just as your family, if you're at home, gather around with your kids and just take this moment of prayer. And I'm just going to do that and then I'm going to pray for you guys. So let's do that now. Dear Lord, I know it's easy to forget as a people all the things that you've carried us through as a nation, as a group, as a, as a church, as a people, Lord, that it's always been your goal to bring people into unity. And I just pray, Lord, that we as a church, as a group of people that say that we honor you, become the catalyst to unity that you've given us through your Son. I pray that we are quick to love others, Bring, bring in a spirit of uh, cooperation, of love, a, a spirit of truth, to only be divisive to, when it is necessary because of the truth, Lord. Lord, let your church be the bright example of what it means to come together in a dark time. That we resolve our conflicts, Lord, with the, in a way that brings honor to you as a family. Now, Lord, I just pray and I lift up our first responders who were there on that day, who saw all the horror and the tragedy, those who've lost people, on that day that are still grieving, a husband, a daughter, a son, a mother, a father, Lord. I just pray for those families. And I pray for all the people since that day who have put themselves out there to bring about protection and unity to our nation, Lord. Uh, continue to, to bring them safety, um, even while they're sacrificing their own safety for ours. Let us take that time, those opportunities, and the freedoms that you've given us to always remember to to do our part in bringing people together when, it's, when we can. And we thank you for that. So I just wanted to close with a verse here just to keep us and uh, to remind us of some of the things that we could do as a church and, a, and believers. So I'm here in Romans chapter 12 uh, and in verse nine it says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, 
Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Continue the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own eyes, but repay, or repay evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of our Lord. And if at all possible, and as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And that's what we're trying to do here as a people and as a church. And so that is uh, the reason why we do every church in general. And so if, if one of the ways you can contribute to helping us bring unity to the community and to those around us is through your giving and your sacrifice and your offering through that as well. So if, if something is, is touching you, we're, we're about to help a veteran who's in need in a James project coming up. Um, we want to bring unity to our community. So if that's something that interests you and God feels you led to give, feel free to give. If not, just pray. Just pray for a unity of people. Just uh, do your part to kind of be a member of the community and bring that unity and so that we can live at peace under God. Thanks. Hey Amanda, what's up? Are you here yet? Hey, I just got up the hill. Where do I go from here? What? Where do I go from here? Well, where, where are you? I don't know. You don't know? What's what's around you? Um, I'm in a city. No, what city are you in? Oh, it's, it's that one near us. Okay, what street are you on? Um, it's got a lot of big yellow lines on it. No, what's the name of the street? Oh, I don't know. The sign's too far away for me to see. How can I tell you where you are? Well, there's goats right next to me. Goats? Yeah, goats, you know, they go, ah! Well, that doesn't help. I don't know. Well, how can I tell you where to go if you don't know where you are? Years ago when I was in youth ministry, we had the opportunity to go build a house down in Mexico. And on our way out of the trip, we passed through Tijuana. Now, what was awesome about going there was supposed to be this exciting opportunity to barter and buy some cool souvenirs for people and get a good small price on as you barter and work it down. In fact, watched one of my friends do an excellent job at this. He sat there, saw the thing he wanted, offered a price, and on they went down until he got to the price he said he wanted. And I was impressed. I'm like, this looks pretty easy. I can do this. So I went up and I found something I was interested in. I started talking to the guy. I'm like, I'll give you so much. And he goes, no, it's this much. And I'm like, okay, here we go. We're going to do this. I go, okay, well, how much this much? He goes, no. And he says the same exact price. He says, that's the price. And I'm like, so I try again. He's like, no, that's the price. And I'm like, uh, I walk away and nothing happens. Like literally happened over and over and over again. I'm horrible at bartering, awful at trying to get a deal. I'm not good at it on the internet. And I just told all of you who the sucker is in the room. So if you're a salesman, please leave me alone. But the point to, that happened for me was this reality that suddenly I am not good at estimating the value of something apparently. I am not good at getting things where I need them or think they should be. And to be honest, I don't think any of us are really good at this, especially when it comes to human value. A lot of us get human value all messed up in a bartering system of the world where we're trying to claim this is how much you're worth because of how hard you work, or this is how much you're worth because of how smart you are, and all these kinds of things. Nope. Our job, it, our value is not set by these things, and our job is to actually come to understand our value rightly, right? Because in this series, Knowing You, what we're talking about is the idea that to develop spiritually, you got to know yourselves rightly. Because if you don't know yourself rightly, you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're at, you don't know where you're going. You're not going to grow spiritually. You're not going to go in the right direction. So what I want to challenge us to is to remember that we've got to be growing spiritually by understanding who we are. As Paul put it, he says, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. There is a value statement. But to think with sober judgment, a value statement. We're not supposed to think of ourselves greater. We're not supposed to think of ourselves lesser. We need to understand who we are and our value rightly. And that's what I want to focus on today. I want to talk about our value. I want you to understand your value because to know 
your value rightly, you'll be able to grow spiritually. And so to develop spiritually, right, we need to know that value rightly. You need to know yourself rightly. And I want to challenge us to that reality. And in fact, we have a problem that throws it all off. Not just that we barter with it, but there's a background to why we value ourselves the way that we do. In fact, we can see that background goes back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3. If you've got your Bible, open it up there. And what I want to do is I want to show you that our problem with value doesn't begin with when you're born. It began with humanity all the way back because of a particular set of problems. You see, in every single person is a story. Your story, my story, and around all those stories are these communities that we've been talking about. And those communities in our stories have a tendency to do something, whether they're your natural family community, your work community, that soccer team, that neighborhood you grew up in, that church you went to when you were younger. They have a tendency to either wound you or encourage you to give you joys. What I think we need to do in order to know our value rightly is we need to assess our wounds and our joys. We need to be able to look at what has wounded us and what has enabled and given us joy in life. We see that as part of the whole story here in Genesis chapter 3. As we pick it up, we, we're going to begin here in verse 7, and it says this, Now she's eaten of the apple, Eve has taken that apple, that fruit, whatever it is, classically we call it an apple, but she's taken this fruit and she's eaten it, and all humanity has plunged themselves into willful defiance of God. God gave us everything we needed, and we said, nah, we'll do it ourselves. With that whole massive problem, humanity finally sees their issue. They're aware of their sin. And so, this is what happens. Then, the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they, made, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said to him, Well, wait a minute. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Okay. Right here we see two of the framing wounds that all of us have faced in our communities. The first one is right back here, if you'll look up at verse 7. It starts off with them both seeing that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then they hid from the Lord. Now, what's interesting here is we would call this the wound of distance. That what we do often is we wound each other by backing away from each other. And it's not something that we see overtly, but you felt it when you're in the middle of a conversation with someone you love, and you've offended them, and they give you the silent treatment. They won't talk to you anymore. They won't acknowledge you. They won't answer your texts, your phone calls, your Facebook posts, nothing. They're done with you. And that distance hurts. It harms. And Larry Crabb in his book Inside Out actually calls it the sin of self-protection. And when we can people please and do all these kinds of things and go along to get along in order just to keep people at bay and keep them away from ourselves, we sin and we do not love people. We wound each other. In fact, the worst form of this is apathy. It's the kind of thing you and I face every single day. If you live in a city or you go to work and you walk around a city or you're driving in the car, you don't get acknowledged as a human. You're just a passing object. You can even wave at people and they don't wave back. You could say hello to people and they just keep on moving, stone-faced and cold. That kind of apathy is like a small pinprick wound day in, day out, over and over and over again, and it defeats us. It makes us feel unhuman. And suddenly, these wounds are huge. And in your story, you're going to see lots of times that people distance themselves from you because of something that you did or because of something that they just didn't like about you, but they didn't tell you. And so these wounds sit there. You know it. You feel like you've been pushed away, uncared for. And the flip is then you have assault. This is the out-and-out -out attack of somebody with their words or their actions. Adam does this at the end. When God addresses the issue, Adam said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit. Notice the blaming and the assault. It's your fault, God. It's your fault, woman. This is my fault. Yeah, I ate it, but you, you shouldn't have given me all this stuff. This kind of assault grows. 
In fact, it came to the point where his son Cain would kill Abel over a jealous spat of worship. And what we find here is that human beings will assault each other with our words, will assault each other with our finances, will assault each other over and over again to hurt one another. I don't know about you, maybe it was a group of friends in your neighborhood who called you names and who you physically punched you or beat you up. Maybe it was a group of kids at school or perhaps some coworkers who have purposely worked against you to get you to lose that job. Maybe it's just backbiting and bitterness that's going on in the background. Well, all these wounds build up. And if you're not aware of these wounds, what will happen is you're not going to be aware of how they affect the way that you value yourself and the value system that you've picked up. But it's not enough just to look at the wounds. What we have to do is also remember that in every story, in every community, there are certain amounts of joys and, and good blessings that come. For example, Paul talking to the Philippians, he talks about the church. He says, in the spiritual community, if there's any encouragement, if there's any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection, any sympathy, if somebody's come to your house and somebody's died and they come around you to care about you, if they're celebrating your birthday and, or they're like, excited that you graduated, so they got you a computer or whatever. In our stories are lots of these beautiful encouragements, comforts, joys, and loves. And what's interesting is when they're tied to our wounds and we start to map them out by doing a special idea, which, I, which is a, a life timeline, and I would encourage you to do this at some point as you're learning about yourself, is, is start off with your earliest memories and write the negatives and the positives. And as you begin to lay out these pains and these joys, these wounds of distance or these wounds of assault or these joys of blessing, as you lay them in, you're going to discover that there were things that you were encouraged in and there were things that you were pushed away from. There were things you were wounded about and they have formed how you value yourself, how you view yourself and how you view how you are as a person. And so I want to encourage you not to ignore these things. You've got to come to the place where you understand these joys and these pains so you can begin to see your value and aware of these things or the world and these communities have already conformed you. They've already shaped you in a way that you will not spiritually grow because to know your value rightly and to, is to grow spiritually, right? To, to grow spiritually, we have to know our value. We have to understand where it really comes from. But to know your value rightly, you need to assess them where that value is coming from. You've got these wounds, these things, that helps you begin to say, well, where do these values really ultimately come from? When do I feel like I'm a valuable person? When do I feel like I'm actually useful? And I wanna give you um, four of them. They come from this book called Search for Significance. And Search for Significance is an older book, uh, read it in seminary, but it is super helpful to identify four basic devaluings, four basic self-worth issues that occur. And the first one is pretty plain to see in a lot of Americans. In fact, it's in me, is the idea that my value comes from my performance. The better I do and the more I'm able to, to go and perform and succeed, the better I feel about myself. You're climbing the corporate ladder. You're getting the awesome grades. You're making the, the commitments and the sports teams are winning because of your coaching or your play or whatever. You feel valuable. And this is part of the performance trap that we can find ourselves in. You see, my story, as I look back, is one of rejection by friends, constantly being beat up, pushed down, constantly being people-pleased and distanced from, all these different things. But when I came home and I brought a good grade, when I came home and I learned something new, I got praise and accolades and rejoicing and, oh man, you're so smart and all this stuff. And so what happened as my teachers poured into me that way, as my parents poured into me that way, and my friends pushed me away in other ways, I gave myself to academics. Because if I could succeed in academics, man, then I was valuable. And so what I've found is the further I've gotten away from, from the world of academics, the more I've had to search for, well, what exactly is my value? And I've tried to not pour it into the performing at the church, but it is so hard for me because I'm one of those performance people. The danger is it goes even further, though. Not just in life to feel valuable that way, but with God. Some of us have taken that performance mentality and it's part of your spiritual life. You actually believe you have to perform better in your prayers, better in your Bible studies, better in your quiet. You miss a quiet time. You miss a time alone with God. You miss your, your time devotional or whatever you call it, and, and you're done. You're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't perform well enough today. This is called legalism, and it's a classic trap. In fact, the Galatians which was a church in the ancient time that Paul had planted, were in that trap. He tells them this, we know that a person is not justified, that means made right, and you know, when you stand up in a court of law and you, you make an argument that you are right, that's to justify yourself. 
Well, he knows that a person is not justified before God by works of the law, by your performance. Instead, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we, the Jewish people, have also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, not by performance. Because by the works of the law, by performance, no one is going to be made right. You can't be made right, and so it stunts your spiritual growth when we find our value in performance. When we find our value of who we are in our performance and how we do, you will be devastated if you're fired. You will be devastated if you fail at something in your life. And you will strive and stress and wither on the vine. Performance is a place where we get it, but also approval is a place we get it. This is another one that's deep inside of me because approval is hard to define because it's really about people accepting you and you accepting people. And so if you're an approval addict, the problem is that you're going to find that you cannot draw a line with someone in your life. Even if they're sinning against you, even if they're abusing you with assault, you learn somewhere back there it was better to shut up and just be accepted than to stand up. And you, through your story, you got endorsed and encouraged to stick it out and, hey, look how awesome you are. Or you got um, these wounds from somebody or you got wounds, wounded when you tried to get away and somebody crushed your dream of escaping the assault or the pain or, the, or trying to draw that line. And that person you drew the line on just overwhelmed you with pain. And so you've never been able to move back. Look, this kind of desire leads to all kinds of people pleasing all this go along to get along stuff, it leads to you ignoring and becoming a, ignoring the pain you're receiving and becoming a doormat of, life, of a person. And approval is dangerous. In fact, we don't see it, but it's a sin called people pleasing. In fact, Paul, to the Galatians who were falling into this trap as well, he said, What? Am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I wouldn't be the servant of Christ. He says, we don't try to please men. Don't try to please these teachers. We don't try to please these people. We don't try to please people who are wrong. Paul will spend the rest of the book telling them why these men are wrong, why these bad teachers are wrong. Not to please them. He wants to please God. But that's the trick, isn't it? We feel like we can't please God. We feel like we can't. We, we, we're doing all this stuff, but somewhere deep down inside, you just don't feel like God's ever going to accept you. God's never going to allow you in because, man, you're just not doing it right. You're not living well enough. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not doing what he's asked you to do. He, if, surely he's rejected you and pushed you out because you've sinned. All of these things are part of that danger, and it holds and halts your spiritual growth because you'll follow men rather than God every single day. In fact, the third way that we try to find our value because of our wounds in the past and the joys is, is through this situation of trying to get away from blame. Because we've lived with blame. Somebody's accused you of something over and over and over again or told you you're worthless because of what you've done and will never let you up from some sin or situation you've been in. Or maybe it's just simply that you have, you've grown up in a world of everything has got to be right and perfect and good and so you're judgmental. Look. This is part of that reality of the fall. Remember what Adam did? He blamed. Let's look at it again. He said, who told you that you were naked? God asks, who, have you eaten of that tree? And the woman, he says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit, the tree, and I ate. There's all the blame that he needed. And Adam was judgmental. He thought of himself greater than he was. His value was out. And he goes, it's her fault. It's your fault. Now imagine after God removes them from the garden, did Adam continue this bitterness? He continue to blame, continue to throw guilt at, at Eve, because imagine Eve's life. She sits there feeling like, yeah, I am to blame. I fell for this. This is ridiculous. You know, she, she can't escape Adam. This is just awful. And who knows the dynamic, if it was good or bad or what. But we can imagine that she's under this blame, and he is blaming because they just both can't escape, that they should be punished for what they did wrong. And if you're stuck in the blame game, you know when you sin, you think one thing. Man, I need to be punished. I need to be punished. I'm worthy of the punishment. I'm worthy of the punishment. I don't need to tell you that you, you're, you deserve hell. You know it. What you don't understand is how God could possibly love you because you can't do enough. You can't get enough punishment. You can't penance enough to get free so God can love you. And it's crushing your spiritual life because you think somewhere there, if you were just innocent enough, then you would have value. The innocent people have value. The innocent people are right. The last one is really very similar. It's the idea of shame. And, and shame is just one step further. It's living in a situation where you just believe you can't change. 
It's where you've been so crushed, there's just no transformation available for you. If you were somebody else, then God would love you. If you were somebody else, then you'd be lovable. But you as you, no, nah, nobody's going to love you now. This is often found more in older people who've gone through so much suffering, so much pain. The only times they've really received accolades is when they feel like it wasn't them that did it. And look, I, we need to look back at these things and sense that shame and see those things and realize that the only way that we ever feel valued is that when we feel like we are being different, when we're not that person, you're striving to be a different person. You don't want to think about who you were. Maybe you're even trying to recreate yourself. And the bottom line is this kind of shame and this kind of stuff just kills your value. It sucks it away. It's about perfection and it's about being innocent and about you know, success. This is all the bartering that we do from our stories. I and mean, you need to be aware of it. Which one is fitting you? Because we need to set it aside. We need a new perspective. You and I need a perspective on our value that comes from a different place. And I'm not talking about the inside. Look, to, to know your value rightly, know how God values you. Okay, that's the case. Look, we are often taught in our culture to look inward to look at your feelings, to find your value inside, to affirm yourself and, you know, you do you and, you know, give yourself some me time. And uh, look, in some cases, it's right to look inside and see how God has made you, see that you're unique and affirm that God has made you who you are, but not our sin. We'll get to that next week and not the garbage and not the false values. When you look inside, you're going to only find your feelings. No wonder all of us actually look outside for our value. We look outside and we get the blame. We look outside and we get the, the accolades for performance or for affirmation, right? That's all outside of us. And we're built this way. You see, you and I are made in the image of God. I, got, I keep saying this, but this is the theme of the series. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. The only female, he created them. In the image of God, he created you. He created me. He created all of us. And so what I want you to understand is that you and I are derivatives, we are images, we're reflections of God's glory, and that means our value isn't in here, it's coming from out there. And when God's value is found in the image of God, you have a value that isn't moving around and bartered on on earth. It is a firm, static, 100% value. Now, where do I get that value from? How do I know what the image of God is worth? Well, it comes into one word. The word is love. You see, throughout the scriptures, God's trying to remind us of something, right? Do not sin, right? We're like, oh, don't sin. Oh, I love sin. You know, we get all in our huffy in our culture about the word sin. But if we were to put it this way, don't treat God with contempt. Don't treat him like you wouldn't treat somebody that you love. And don't treat each other cruelly. Don't devalue one another. Don't harm one another, distance from one another, all that stuff, right? That's sin. We go, yeah, that makes sense. Because we don't want to be devalued. I don't want to devalue other people, but we do it. And when we do this, God says, that's not good. Love me, love others as I have loved you. Look, this is the kind of love that I'm talking about. Love is the definition of not sinning. Love is the definition of caring for one another. And I'm not talking about fluffy marshmallow love. I'm talking about strong, solid, self-sacrificial care so the other person can grow in the good. Okay, that's the kind of love I'm talking about. And so when we look at this, we realize love is what's defining the value so what does that look like? Thanks to God, we have John who wrote this letter and he told us this, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation, big word, we'll get back to that, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we are ought to love one another. So what does this mean? In this situation, it's not that God, that we loved God, that, oh God, I love you, and so we know what love is. No, we know what love is because God sent his son to bear our sins. This word propitiation is the word, the sacrifice. It means the idea of an atoning sacrifice, one who bears our sins, bears our punishment, takes it away and makes God appeased, makes us connected with God again. There's so much in this word, but I want you to hear me for a minute. The definition of love and what this means for you and for me is this, that you and I are valued at his life. His life for ours. What are you worth? We're worth God's life for our life, his life for ours. I want you to say that with me. What are you valued? His life for ours. Say it again. His life for ours. 
If you can grasp that, you begin to realize the infinite value of God is what he was willing to pay for your life, for my life, for our lives. It's his life for ours. We are valued at the maximum by God's own life in Christ. And this is the foundation for all values. This is where human rights comes from because every human being is worth the death of the God who made them on the cross because he loved them that much. It is worth this person who has infinite value, whatever they've done, whether they've received him or not, no matter how they've treated God said, I love you anyway. Though you're a sinner, though you're broken, that you've done all these things, I will give my life for yours. Will you receive that? And when he does this, he gives us a value that's fixed in history. You can't change that he died on the cross. You can't change that he came. You can't change that he loved us with his own life. You can't go back in history and remove that. No, what you and I have is a fixed value of God's life for ours. We are made in his image, infinite in value, never changing. This is is illustrated easily by the very thing that we've, we've forgotten how beautiful it is, the wedding ceremony. See, one of the reasons we tell youth, and I'm telling you guys, you don't have sex before you're married is because sex is giving yourself to someone. It is literally handing your whole life over to a person, being as vulnerable as you can. It's not just an activity. It's a soul-on-soul mingling relationship. And so that's high value. It's the highest form of giving yourself to someone. And so what God says is, you don't do that until you valued each other rightly. So how much is the value for sex? Is a couple dates, you know? Maybe 150 bucks for the, you know, that's, that's three or four dates, right? Or, you know, a couple words, I love you. How cheap have we made ourselves? Just a hookup? No wonder people feel so devalued when they're running around a sex culture because the original intent with sex was to say that you stand before God, you stand before others, and you say, my life for yours, your life for mine. When that has happened, you valued each other rightly. You don't treat each other as cheap prostitutes or payments or anything else. You said, I will give all of my life for yours. You give all your life for mine. And now we value each other. Now I'll give you myself. So what God did is he came and he said, your value is so high, so great. I give you my life. That's how much you are worth. And so now we see this. It should adjust all the other ways we gather value. I'm not saying you don't gather some value. You don't get energized by performance or feeling innocent or these things, but it's changed by the fact that God has eternally valued you. It cannot be changed. And so to know your value rightly, trust the cross has set it right. Trust the cross is removing these false ways to give you the right ways. What am I saying? Well, first of all, if you're struggling with performance, if you're struggling to make God pleased with you and other people pleased with you, remember God's already pleased with you. He's justified you already. It says in Romans, since we have been justified by faith, when you trust Christ, then we have peace with God. He has made you right. He has done all that you need to do. In fact, here's the word. Christianity is not about do, do, do. It's about what's been done. You don't work for your salvation. You work from your salvation. See, we get to now perform out of worship for God. We get to succeed out of worship to God. We get to give him that success. And when we don't, our value is not hindered. It's not changed. Our value is locked in eternity. His life for mine, his life for ours. And now I go, okay, well, this is what God has for me. How can I do best from this spot? Defeat and lack of success and failure doesn't destroy value. It just changes the way we approach things. And I don't want you then to think that you have to earn God's love. You can't. He's already paid it all. It's already finished. He's accepted you today, and he did it before you were born. He loved you and gave his life for you before you even had a thought. He knew you that well. What an incredible reality. You don't work for that. You don't work for it. You work from it. You rejoice from it. If you're stuck for approval and all you're longing for is everybody and you're afraid to draw a line because someone will reject you and because you're afraid that maybe God rejected you somewhere back there. And if I'm only valuable if I'm approved of, let me tell you the truth, God's approved of you. In the cross, we see that he has done something. If we start here in Colossians, again, Paul's writing, he says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind. So yeah, you were once rejected. You were once outside doing evil deeds. But he's now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him. 
check this out, he reconciles you, he brings you in, he pays the debt. He says, yeah, I, I, you were detestable, but I've cleaned you up, I bring you in, I provide for you, I love you, I make you holy, I make you blameless, I make you above reproach, I make you all that I want you to be because I love you. And so we don't approve of people because, man, I hope they love me. Now we go from that love and we love people. We go from that acceptance to go out and reach out and accept people and lives change. I'm not saying we accept the sin. I'm not saying we accept that stuff. I'm saying we accept people into our lives. It's a reality. We're all sinners. Let's get out there and care for people because God has accepted us. He's transformed us. He's overcome our need of approval by approving of us even before we were born. He says, I love you. Come in. Come to me. And he straightens and cleans us up and makes us holy and right with Him. Now, maybe you're struggling with the blame. Everybody's wrong and everything's got to fall into your place and you're struggling that if you could be right, if I could just be punished enough, whatever it is, stop and realize, number one, only God is perfect and that perfect God has loved you. And God is perfect and that perfect God has done something else. He's been your propitiation, right? And this is the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. See, again, He took the blame. He took the punishment. There's no need to beat yourself up in penance so that God will love you. If you've sinned, realize all of your sin that you've committed was future when Jesus died on the cross. Your sins that are still future are still covered when you've trusted Jesus Christ died on the cross. You are forgiven then. One day you'll see it fully and completely when he returns. But right now you need to remember when he died, he was a propitiation then for your sin. And now you trust him. And if you sin today, it's not like you got to go back to the starting point and work for it and punish yourself. And oh, I got to trust Jesus again. No, get up. God's right there with you. He loves you. He's brought you in. He's already paid for it. He's going, get back on the saddle. Let's keep moving. Why are we sitting here on the ground crying about this? I forgive you. I see you are sorry. I'm, yes, I'll give you a little swat on the bottom. Let's move. Because he wants you to grow. He wants you to develop. He wants you to do things for the kingdom of God. Not to get stuck in lament and sorrow and I'm bitter and everybody else is a sinner and I feel better when I can. No, he says, drop all that. Let God be judged because he's already judged his son for you. You're free. He gave his life for yours. That is the beauty of your value. He values you at his own life. And that means even when it comes to shame, you don't have to stay there. Maybe you think, I could never change. I'm just stuck in this sin. I kept doing it over and over again. I just, nothing ever changes. Remember that Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. That means this, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ and you've come to him, you are born again. You're a new creation, a new creature. He has redeemed you and transformed you. Yes, there's the old you that rears up. Just, you know, tell that guy to go away and live out the new life. You are a new you. God discounts all that sin, all that mess as the old you. But when you're walking in the good and you're walking in his righteousness and you're following after his spirit, that is the new you that he's put in you. And what we have is an opportunity to rejoice in that and celebrate in that, to know that he's accepted you, to know that he doesn't blame you, to know that he no longer pushes you in shame. He bore the shame on the cross. The cross is shameful and awful, and he took that, he took your guilt, he took all the punishment, he has set you free because he loves you so much, he gave you, his life for yours. And so, this is critical if you're going to understand your value, to see that it comes from the cross and it comes from Christ, and that your value is unmovable, unchanged in him. But here's the thing, some of you have yet to have said that key phrase, my life for yours. God's saying, here, my life for yours. Here, here you go. And I said, I need to turn back to him. And so my life for yours. Maybe today you need to realize that God has loved you so much. God has given you the value and valued you so much that he was willing to give his life for yours. Are you willing to give your life to him? Because that's the right exchange. And when we give our lives over to Christ, when we have received his work on the cross, when we have faith and he makes us new and he pays for our sin and he writes us in our values, it's because we have been willing to say, God, I'm giving you my life. 
Today, maybe you need to do that right now. I want to give you a chance to do that. He is willing to receive you right where you are. He's already paid for your sins. He's already given you this opportunity. The question is, will you trust his promise? Will you trust him? And if that is you right now and you're saying, yes, I want to trust him, then just tell him. Bow your heads with me. Just say, God in heaven, I trust that Jesus Christ has borne my sin. He's borne my punishment. He's done everything that I need to be right with you. I trust that he took my shame and I trust that you can make me new. I trust that he rose from the dead to give me that life. And I want to follow you. I give you my life here and I receive yours. Thank you, Lord, for giving this to me in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you and you just prayed that with me, I want to encourage you. Let us know. This is the beginning point, not the end point. Now we work from our salvation. We celebrate from it. So let us know you made that decision. Uh, with the just text at this number down here that you, you begin and this number, and we will get a hold of you. Let the person who is in the, in the screen right now with you, your host, sorry, hosts, they, they would love to hear from you. Just let them know you made that decision. And we would love to help you begin to grow. Now, for the rest of us, guys, we need some chiropractic moments here. Because again, to develop spiritually, we need to know our value rightly. And now that we know where our value comes from, it's his life for ours, then we need to repent and turn away from the performance, turn away from all of this acceptance and blame and shame. And we need to ask God to, to teach us again, to trust in him and his, to go back to him and say, God, you gave me your life, I'm following you. And so today, one of those four things may be holding you down. I ask that you would just take a minute online and just say, God, this is what's got my soul. Will you please reveal to me my value in you? Will you please confirm it to me? Maybe you need to go back into this video and you need to write down those verses. But We want to encourage you in your small group time and in the rest of your times with God to go back to these values and to remind yourself that, hey, I am made in the image of God, his life for mine, his value, he has set my value, it doesn't change. And in that case, we can then move forward into what we'll get into next week. But please, take that time. Get in prayer with God. Ask him to reveal where your value needs to be corrected. And then seek him in those things. Let me pray for you. Father, I know that in this journey for me, you've shown me so many ways that my soul and my value need to be corrected. God, will you meet all these olive branchers to help them do the same. You are faithful. I know you will. Thank you for the time that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, thanks for joining us. And for those of you who are exclusively our online community, um, we know that it's kind of hard to get connected with people and see people. You don't get to come to service, eyeball and go, oh, I've missed you, I haven't seen you. And some of you have literally been in your home for, for a very long time now. Get out here and there and you get to run into somebody, but for safety reasons, you just have not re-engaged at the church um, in the physical presence. And, and we want to let you know that we know you're there. But we also want to help you guys see who else is there. So we are inviting you to an online Zoom gathering on a, a, the 26th, and it's going to be at 2 p.m. And what we're asking you guys is sign up with us. Let us know you're coming. We want to be able to pray and, and connect. We've got some a, a small outline of time just to, so we can identify and connect and, and talk a little bit. It's going to be a, a, just a gathering on Zoom so we can at least see, hey, you can see each other and go, oh my goodness, I haven't seen you, just as an opportunity to kind of have that passing moment and that bit of connection. We, we miss you guys. We want to have that connection as staff, and we want to have that connection uh, with each other as well. And so here's how what you do. You're going to text Zoom uh, to the number at the bottom of the screen here, and you're going to sign up in that way, and it'll give you a link to the meeting. And you come join us, and we just want to uh, just spend some time together. We want to have some fun. We want to connect, and I would love for you guys to be there. We'll tell you more as, as it gets closer, but we're just glad you've been with us. And may the Lord bless you as you get into your communities and understand what God has given you. Have a great rest of your week, and we will see you next week.